Well, good morning, everyone. And good morning, everyone, and welcome to the new um, uh, for a competencia breakfast. Uh, we have the uh, honor today of having Professor Fred Jenny with us. He's a good friend of, uh, of all of us um, and a professor at ESEC Business of School in Paris and also the chairman of the competition committee of the OECD. So he will be speaking to us today about the, the challenges, uh, the current challenges to competition law. So Fred, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. buenos dias a todos. I'll continue in English uh, uh, because my Spanish is not uh, sufficient uh, by a long shot. Um, but uh, thank you very much for having invited me to this uh, uh, breakfast. Um, and uh, thank you very much, Julian, for having organized uh, all this. Uh, I was going to talk about uh, difficulties that uh, or challenges that competition authorities face and uh, and more specifically within those challenges about the challenges which are raised by uh, the digital sector and uh, the way to uh, in which competition authorities can approach uh, this problem. But before I start, I must say that uh, some of you here, uh, I guess the band uh, and others uh, were here uh, yesterday uh, for a Latin American competition forum in which there was a highly interesting discussion, thanks to the participant and Esteban in particular, uh, highly interesting discussion on something which is only vaguely related to the topic today, which is uh, uh, payment systems and uh, how competition authorities can deal with uh, those payment systems. And, and to me, there was one thing, I mean, there were two things that came out. One of them was that there was, first of all, quite a bit of activity in Latin America on this issue. So it's obviously an interesting issue from the competition law point of view. Second, there was a general agreement, I would say, on the fact that uh, trying to eliminate exclusionary practices in this uh, sector was of paramount importance, both for competition, but also for social reasons uh, uh, as well. And therefore, the development of fintechs uh, to compete with banks was uh, uh, where competition authorities have been very active uh, was uh, very useful. And then there was a third part, which we did not explore to the full extent, uh, which is the, uh, the issue of pricing in, uh, in uh, payment system and uh, uh, commissions, uh, uh, which are taken on, on retailers and those things. And then what, what was clear was to me was that there was a big divide between uh, the economists who talked to us, who was uh, Ms. Abronte, uh, Mets, um, and we told us basically, well, we're, do, we're facing um, two-sided markets on the one hand and uh, bundles on the other hand of services. And in those circumstances, it becomes very problematic when competition authorities or governments intervene in the pricing mechanism on one dimension, let's say the interchange fee, uh, because it may have uh, undesired effects on, on many other aspects of uh, the activity of those banks. Now, I heard this, I, I knew that she was going to say something like this because that's typically what economists will say, but, but this was just uh, a major divide, I would say, between economists and competition authorities and, and the way they, in fact, they have intervened on those issues, because in many countries, uh, starting with Australia, which I think was the first country, competition authorities uh, uh, intervened and uh, fixed prices or, or find uh, uh, interchange uh, uh, fees for being excessive um, without really being able to take into consideration all of the elements that are that go with A, the multi-sided uh, nature of the market, but B, the fact that on each side of the markets, you have bundles of services and that uh, if you fix the price of one, that may have repercussions on, on the others. Um, I'm saying this because today, if we talk about the digital sector and competition authorities, we're going to be faced a little bit with the same issues. Um, uh, so a number, uh, I would say that competition authorities and competition law agencies are facing a bit of a crisis uh, these days. 
uh, and a number of issues have been raised, uh, issue about the fact that the goals of competition authorities uh, or, or competition laws is too narrow, uh, only, I mean, narrowly focused on, on consumer surplus, uh, that the focus of the analysis is too short. And uh, so they tend to look at uh, immediate effects and uh, also too narrow in the sense that uh, it's mostly uh, uh, price effects. Um, the fact that merger control or is inadequate to talk in, to take into consideration dynamic uh, inefficiency efficiency sorry um, and part of this debate was uh, initiated uh, because of the growth of the digital sector uh, and I want to explore this and uh, say a little bit about what I think we know we should know and where competition authorities can uh, maybe do uh, a more complete job of uh, trying to integrate economic analysis and, and legal consideration. Now, on the spectacular growth of the digital market, I mean, I just have a few figures that I would uh, want to run by you because I think they are stunning. Um, um, the technology allowing computers to communicate was born in 1989. Okay, that was 30 years ago. Today, there are 4.7 billion people in the world, which is 59% of the global population who are active internet users. So in 30 years, there's been an explosion of uh, the uh, digital market. Due to, I mean, together, I would say, uh, with a number of uh, other factors, a tremendous increase in the computing capacity Computing capacity has been roughly multiplied by 200,000, multiplied by 200,000 between 1993 and 2020. A considerable increase in the storage capacity of data. Uh, if one wants to take, uh, in, in 1956, there was an IBM model 350, which, was the, which had the largest storage capacity in the world. And uh, it could store five megabyte. And uh, now, the if you take a little disk uh, uh, of 128 uh, gigabyte, uh, it can store 25,600 times more than this enormous computer uh, of 1956. Um, but besides the capacity in uh, storage and the capacity in treatment, uh, there has been the development, I mean, we've seen over the 30 years of five mutually reinforcing technologies. One of them has been the technology of sensors, um, uh, the sensors that you find in the 1.4 billion smartphones, which were sold in 2020. And uh, there was a roughly equal number of uh, smartphones that were sold uh, in the previous years. Um, um, the sensors are printed on chips. They are very small uh, and they are installed everywhere uh, on every product and sometimes on us, for example, uh, there are ID chips for pets and, and uh, there are also ID chips for blood glucose sensors for people. Uh, uh, the second, so there's been development in sensor, development in the internet of things, the fact that uh, you can uh, use those sensors to connect machines to the internet and have communication between the internet and, and the things. Uh, so those are the smart connected products that communicate uh, via the internet with a centralized service and share uh, local data with the headquarter, which is somewhere on the internet and receive instructions in, in return. Big data has been the third technology, which has uh, uh, exploded. Um, um, the average car you all have a car. The average car contains uh, 30 microprocessor, 80 sensors, and 100 million lines of code. Uh, and each car generates uh, a terabyte of data per day. Uh, okay, and this is only one car. Uh, okay. uh, now, pretty much every action anyone takes online is logged. And then using the storage capacity uh, and the treatment, uh, uh, this information is, uh, is uh, used uh, to predict uh, cloud technology and cloud computing. So massive processing and storage resources, which are offered on demand uh, by Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and, and others. 
uh, and the cost of storing has come down to practically zero because of the uh, scale economies uh, in the development of cloud. And finally, and most importantly, probably artificial intelligence, which certainly didn't exist uh, 30 years ago, at least not in the form that it has taken now, which refers to a range of technologies, uh, statistical methods to try to analyze data. Um, and so this is called machine learning or deep learning. So uh, you need a large set of data. And from this large set of data, you can extract observations and predictions about how uh, individuals are going to uh, behave. Um, now, what's interesting, and, and I want to emphasize that, uh, this was not the way that artificial intelligence was going to go uh, to 20 or 30 years ago when one was thinking about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, there was the hope that one could, in fact, duplicate the human mind in a machine. And this was abandoned uh, because it didn't turn out to be practical or feasible. Uh, for the adoptions of methods which are really kind of regression methods. I mean, using a large set of data to try to analyze the structure of the data and from the structure of the data to predict something. We are going to see in a minute uh, that uh, there is a consequence to this development of artificial intelligence, which is the fact that the more data you have, the better is your prediction. Uh, now, this has implications for concentration and, and uh, for competition that I will uh, come back to. Okay, part of the debate uh, on the future of competition and competition authority is based on the feeling that competition authorities have completely failed in their mission, uh, particularly with respect to the digital sector, uh, both at the substantial level and at the procedural level. Uh, at the substantial level, they have not prevented uh, uh, an increase in concentration and accumulation of profits and things which are possibly signs of uh, the fact that competition doesn't work as well as uh, it could. Uh, and procedurally, uh, the procedures used by competition authority don't seem to be adequate, to be sufficiently flexible, sufficiently fast to deal with some of the issues, particularly when it comes to mergers, for example, uh, in the digital sector. Competition authorities themselves are, seem to have been frustrated by their difficulty to rein in digital firms with the competition tools that they have. Uh, and in various jurisdictions, and certainly this is very much the case in Europe, but not only in Europe, now also in the US, Competition authorities have uh, requested the adoption of ex ante regulatory tools that would allow them to intervene without having to go through the hoops and, and, and complications of real cases without having to uh, make a decision on the substance uh, um, as they are uh, doing uh, now. Others have suggested that uh, besides those ex ante tools, there was also a need to revisit the objectives of competition and that the focus on uh, price, the focus on uh, uh, consumer surplus, the focus on short term were misguided when uh, and not very useful when uh, dealing with the digital sector. Um, so the question I want to discuss is why is it that competition authorities have experienced difficulties in dealing with the digital sector at the substantive level and what can one do uh, about it while preserving the principles on which competition rust, rests uh, rather than throwing the baby in uh, with the water uh, uh, and changing completely uh, the basis for uh, antitrust. So the main message I have is that antitrust has to be adapted to the digital sector because most of the instruments we use in competition law enforcement are not adapted to the reality of the digital sector. And I'm going to try to uh, uh, show that. And there is the risk that if we do not adapt our tools, which means rethinking them, in fact, inventing new tools, there's a serious risk that competition authorities as institutions will be displaced either by, by sectoral regulators, really, um, and that the relevance of competition law enforcement will be questioned more and more 
and that the pressure to change the goals of competition law, as we know them, will be will bring in all kinds of corruption, uh, uh, corruption of populism, corruption of fairness, uh, uh, mixed with efficiencies. Um, so I think there's a real uh, a real issue there, and the competition authority have to very seriously think about how to change their ways when it comes to the digital sector. Now, I would like to start from the business literature because I think that the business literature on digital ecosystems, in fact, tells us a lot about the specificities of not only the ecosystem, but also competition uh, uh, in the digital sector. So let me start with the obvious. Um, um, the obvious is that to assess what is not competition on the merit, what is not an acceptable behavior or transaction, uh, of course, one have to have a clear understanding of uh, what uh, competition, how competition works in the sector and what the business model is. Uh, but there are a number of specificity to keep in mind when we think about the business model of uh, ecosystems uh, to understand how competition works in the digital sector. Now, first, I would say that competition in the digital sector is to a large extent competition between ecosystems. Now, what's an ecosystem? There are a number of definitions of an ecosystem, but try to make it simple and not too controversial. I would say an ecosystem is the combination of a core platform uh, like Google or like Apple, uh, providing some services directly and combining those services with services from others called complementers. Uh, for example, uh, Google Android uh, provides some services like Google Maps, but also uh, allows you to get services from a lot of uh, uh, app developers. Uh, and those are the complementers with which are present on the Google uh, platform. And Google together with the complementer is what is called an ecosystem. Uh, just like Apple and its complementers, or is an, another uh, ecosystem. Now, the relationship between the core platform, Google or Apple, uh, and its complementers is usually organized by the governance rules which are imposed by the platform. Uh, for now, those governance rules are the conditions under which uh, complementers will be allowed on the platform, uh, uh, whether you can distribute your app through the platform or not, and which condition. Um, and those raise those relationships within the platform, raise questions of competition. The best example of this in the field of antitrust is, of course, the issue of Booking.com. Now, Booking.com is a platform, and it says to hotels or people who have uh, rooms to rent, uh, you can advertise your room to rent on my platform because my platform will put you in connection with people who are looking for rooms. Uh, uh, okay, But I impose a condition, which is the fact that you're not going to advertise your rooms on another platform of the same type at a cheaper price than the price that you propose on booking.com. Okay. So we have an issue there. There's a rule of governance, which, is, uh, which has been adopted by booking.com. And booking.com says, well, there's a very good reason for this because it avoids uh, free riding by uh, uh, hotels or by uh, uh, other uh, platforms. Uh, uh, and if I could not prevent this free riding, my platform would be worth nothing. Nobody would look at it. Uh, but there are also possible competition issues. Is this price parity clause, which is imposed by the platform as part of the governance to access the platform, is does that preserve competition between booking.com and other platform, or does it, does it not? Um, okay. Now, the relationship between the platform and its complementers is therefore going to be crucial both for the attractiveness of the ecosystem itself uh, and for competition between the ecosystems. Um, now, uh, if we take Google and Android, as Android uh, and Apple iOS, they also they are platforms. They organize the interface between different types of uh, users, and they also put condition on the app developers to be able to uh, post their app on uh, either one of those uh, platforms. Um, 
uh, for example, it's well known that uh, Apple uh, is much more restrictive in the way it accepts apps for reasons which I will mention later on than Google, uh, but both have conditions under which uh, uh, they will only accept uh, the apps. So that's part of the internal rules of the ecosystem. And the result of those rules is that the ecosystem offers to the consumers a set of services, which is the result of both the services of the platform and the services of the uh, complementers, which is more or less attractive and leads the users to uh, be a user of the platform or not, or to abandon the platform for another platform. For another platform. Um, so the point I want to make here is that the first thing to have in mind is that the competition condition within an ecosystem uh, determine the competition condition between ecosystems. In fact, we have an ecosystem, something that we have learned uh, uh, that, uh, across time, uh, because it's very similar to vertical uh, restraints, uh, which have an impact uh, for competition, uh, for intra-brand competition. And by reducing intra-brand competition, they may increase inter-brand competition. Okay, we have the same kind of issue uh, with, uh, the, the, with ecosystem in the digital sector. What happened within the ecosystem has an impact on the kind of services which is offered by the platform, which is a competitive advantage or disadvantage in the competition with other ecosystems. Um, now, we know that it's taken competition authority quite a long time to realize that uh, restrictions of uh, competition intra-brand was not necessarily a restriction of competition in general, because uh, it could, in fact, increase uh, competition inter-brand and could have a positive uh, value. So what, what is quite interesting is that this uh, realization hasn't yet come to a lot of competition authorities, and I'm only going to talk about the EU uh, in this case. If you take the Google Android case, okay, so the case is about the relationship between the platform, which is uh, Google, and the users of the Android uh, platform, which are in this particular case, the manufacturers of mobile phones, okay? And basically there's an agreement that uh, uh, if you want to use Android, there are a certain number of conditions. You have to uh, have uh, uh, Google Maps or, or Google search on your, uh, I mean, the access is given free, but there are conditions under which this access is granted and the mobile uh, operators have to uh, have, uh, as I said, uh, Google search. And the reason for this, of course, is the fact that uh, Google spends money developing uh, uh, Android, um, but since it doesn't charge for Android, uh, it has got to make money somewhere and it makes money from the advertisers who will then have a large user's base. Uh, um, okay. Now, the fact that uh, uh, the relationship between Google and its complementers is organized in this way, uh, means that Google platform offers a number of services, including Google search, but uh, all the others which are uh, accepted. And the question that the European Commission asked itself was, was where those conditions which are imposed by Google or its complementers and on the mobile uh, phone uh, manufacturer, are they anti-competitive? And basically the answer was yes. Uh, okay, so that led to, to a case. What is quite interesting is that to decide that there was a, a violation, the EU Commission had to find that Google had a dominant position. So to find that it had a dominant position, it had to define the market in such a way that Google would have a dominant position. So it completely ignored the competition between Apple and Google. And he said, well, no, 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 Google is not in competition with Apple, which is nonsensical. I mean, we do agree that uh, people have the choice, consumers have the choice between buying an Apple-based uh, 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 mobile phone or a, an Android uh, but the commission ignored that and said, I'm only interested in the relationship between the platform and its complementers. Okay, so that is the market as I define it. 
and I refuse to look at what the implications are on the competition between Apple and Google. So this is typically like, uh, you know, in the field of uh, vertical restraint, I only look at uh, interbrand competition and I don't want to know whether it has an effect on intra, I only look at intra-brand competition, sorry. And I don't want to know whether it has an effect on inter-brand competition. This is a very partial uh, way to look at competition issues. And also it forces people to, I mean, forces competition authorities to have a slightly unrealistic view of uh, uh, the digital market. Second dimension that I want to explore, economies of scope. One of the important features of digital ecosystem is uh, that they benefit from economies of scopes in two areas. One of them is the algorithm that they use to organize the interaction between different types of users, users and firms or users and app developers. Um, such an algorithm can usually be used to deliver a number of different services. Uh, okay, and you don't have to have one algorithm for each service that you uh, provide. So once you have this algorithm, you can add uh, at very low cost, many other different services uh, uh, and you benefit from those economies of scope. Um, this second dimension is, uh, so, okay, you start being a photo sharing app and you become a social media. You use the same algorithm, but you use the algorithm to do both functions. Uh, okay. Now, this is one area where there are very strong economies of scope in, in, uh, in those um, ecosystems. The other area where there are economies of scope is the use of the data that they're able to uh, gather from uh, the people who use their platform because that data can be used for many different purposes uh, and many different services. Uh, and it's the same set of data. So in a sense, the more services you offer, the lower is the cost of treating this data and, and getting a prediction uh, on what people like, uh, what are the consuming habits and, and how you can target them uh, uh, precisely. Um, now, the fact that ecosystem live in a world of very uh, strong uh, uh, scope economies means that they are not attached to a particular market. It's not like a pipeline firm, a classical firm, which is, I don't know, it's a steel firm and it diversify into another sector, but it is basically a steel maker uh, at heart. Ecosystems don't have a particular attachment to any particular sector, they can add functions and therefore services as they need and as they want because of the uh, economies of scope. And therefore they are, I would say by nature, multi-markets uh, because of those economies of scope. Um, uh, Amazon was a book retailer, it's now a producer and distributor of films, and it hasn't changed its, uh, its I mean, it has used its algorithm and the data that it has on consumers uh, to get there. So competition between ecosystem is not primarily a competition between firms on a market. It's a competition between sets who are multi-markets, diversified, and who could be even more diversified than they are. Uh, so Facebook, for example, is a competitor with Instagram and eventually uh, merged with Instagram. Um, but the notion of relevant market as we use it in competition law, uh, which is uh, must be predefined to start looking at the competition issue, doesn't make much sense or any sense in the digital sector because your competitors maybe other sets, other ecosystem offering different services uh, or offering some of the services that you offer, but many others and becoming more attractive to the users than you are. Uh, in other words, the competition does not necessarily come from someone who does the same thing that you do. And like what we're used to in, in uh, uh, competition among pipeline firms. Uh, now that means that A, the concept of relevant market and B, the concept of potential competition have to be rearranged if we think about uh, the digital sector because uh, certainly potential competition from is much wider, uh, but I will come back uh, to this and relevant market doesn't make sense. Um, 
Now, because the core platform controls the technology which allows different users to interact, and because the platform is successful when it offers an attractive combination of services, competition between ecosystem is largely competition bundled between bundles of services. Um, now, this means that uh, potential competitors to an ecosystem or other ecosystems offering a bundle of services, which seems to be more attractive than the one that you offer. And as I said, they don't have to be exactly the same services. Um, a photo app like Instagram has the potential to displace a social media like Facebook or TikTok can displace other social medias, even though it was not a social media to start with. Um, so potential competition must be explored much more widely uh, than in pipeline firms, which are on a market, which is predefined, where you only have to look at the people who could reasonably enter this particular uh, activity. And there's a legal implication of this uh, because the, there's a narrow standard, particularly in the US on potential competition, where potential competition is only, is only some, someone who's already on the relevant market and could grow and displace you. Um, whereas in the digital sector, it could be anyone, particularly people who are not doing things that you're doing uh, because they could grow using the economies of scope and, and displace you. Uh, and this is the story of the Facebook uh, uh, Instagram merger, for example. Uh, okay. Direct and indirect network effects. Okay, so ecosystems operate in a world which is characterized by direct and indirect network effects. So which means that there are uh, uh, externalities, I would say, uh, either between the fact that you like to be able to communicate with all your friends. And so therefore this is on one side among users or B the fact that the more users there are, the more attractive it is for the app developers or for the advertiser to be locked uh, in, I mean, to be connected to the platform. And this is what I call an indirect uh, network effect. Um, so an ecosystem offers a great many services to a great many type of users, and therefore they are not on two-sided market as we saw yesterday, but they are on multi-sided markets. Now, the fact that they are on multi-sided market means that they can competitors can have very different business models. And this is very easy to understand. If you compare Apple and Google, which is you know, fairly basic uh, in this area. So how does Apple make money? I mean, they are both competing with each other, irrespective of what the EU Commission has said. Uh, and they're competing for people who may want to buy uh, mobile phones uh, and mobile services and all the services that you can get from access to a platform. Now, how does the Apple ecosystem work? Well, the Apple ecosystem works by the fact that Apple sells at a very high margin, extremely sophisticated terminals, uh, uh, iPhone, tablets, computers, and, and all this. Okay. And they get a lot of revenue from those very sophisticated, very stylish, high quality uh, 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 terminals. They also get some money from the app developers to, to get uh, access to, to the platform. Uh, but basically their business model is quality first, quality at the heart of my, uh, which explains why their governance uh, uh, for uh, app developers is much more strict than the, uh, the Google uh, governance, because they only want to have apps that work very well, that are well-conceived, that have value added, et cetera, et cetera, because they know that they have very discriminating people who bought their terminals and who want to have high quality uh, 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 apps. Um, now, what's the business model of Google? Completely different. Google gives away its, uh, uh, it's a platform, I mean, it's iOS uh, system to any producer of cheap telephone. So it's no, it knows that the people who are going to get those iOS Android phone are not people who are particularly discriminating. I mean, there are people who don't have that much money really, and that's why they buy those, uh, okay? So the issue of the quality of the apps or the quality of the services is not quite the same uh, for uh, Google. 
and they don't make money on selling phones, uh, unlike Apple. So where do they make money? Well, they make money in having many users. Okay. Now, to get many users, they want to have many app developers. So there are standards for accepting uh, app uh, uh, is much lower than the, and the result is that I think they've got 50% or 100% more uh, apps on. Um, okay. So to, to offer as many services as possible so that users will want to uh, be on the iOS uh, uh, platform or ecosystem. Okay. And what they sell is advertising uh, for advertisers to reach all those people. So getting many more people is much more important to Google. The source of money is the advertiser. And uh, I mean, they do get a lot of money from the app developers as well, but uh, uh, it's not their main source of revenue. The main source of revenue is uh, access to uh, the users and therefore the maximization of number of users. So we have two business models competing with each other but based on entirely different uh, business model. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, different principles. Um, now, the fact that competitors may have different business model is not completely unknown in competition. And there is one well-known example, which is the TV example, where you have competition between free-to-air TV and pay TV. Okay, but it's not that frequent, uh, and. The in the case that I was uh, uh, mentioning, the case of digital platforms, uh, the business model can be very different. Uh, uh, with as I said, different source of revenue, different objectives. Uh, even if you try to maximize the number of users in in both case. So what this means is that both when we look at competition within an ecosystem and competition between ecosystems we have to factor in the fact that those ecosystems may have different business models and that therefore the competition issues may be different and the ones to consider may be different from one platform to the other. So that makes regulation quite difficult and I'll come back to this when I say a word about the DMA, uh, quite difficult uh, uh, because uh, we have such different business model and uh, on top of this, the network effects are not a structural feature. The network effect can be, first of all, they are stronger or weaker. For example, if you take uh, the example of video games, uh, what's important is to have the latest video game. It's not so much the uh, important to have on a platform all of the possible video games that exist, uh, but you want the, the last one, the one that everybody talks about. Okay. So the network effects are in that case are, are not as uh, important. Uh, they can disappear. Uh, an excellent example is uh, Windows disappeared when there were uh, internet-based operating system that came in. And they can be stronger or uh, weaker depending on the strategy of the uh, platform or the ecosystem. It's, I mean, the platform, uh, the core platform itself. Um, what is very clear is that Amazon built its uh, network effect by publishing comments on books. Uh, okay, so those comments meant that a lot of people were attracted, they wanted to know something about the books they were considering, so they were attracted to the platform, and the more people were there and the more comments were published, the more people wanted to use uh, the platform. So this was a way to create a network effect, to publish all those comments, critics on the books that uh, from users. Uh, okay. This was a deliberate attempt to create a network effect among uh, readers uh, of books when Amazon was mostly distributing books. And it continued when it started distributing other uh, product. Um, it used the same system that uh, if you look at a product, there are recommendation or there are what other people who've looked at this have considered as well uh, to give you ideas about uh, other products that you might want. And this is interesting. And this is this creates, again, a network effect among the users. Uh, the more users use the platform, the more information you get, uh, and the more interesting it is uh, to go to the platform. So network effects are not an exogenous and stable factor. 
unlike what it is if you think about telecom or if you think about electricity, it is an important part of the strategic dimension of the ecosystem. So it must, uh, so the dynamic of those network effects also must be analyzed from the point of view of competition uh, by uh, competition authorities. The next point is that to succeed a platform as an ecosystem, a platform needs a number of things. First of all, it needs a technically superior or innovative service, which is going to be the anchor of the platform. Uh, so, okay. Uh, uh, Spotify, uh, for example, it's uh, it displaced other music streaming because it had a very a much better way to distribute music uh, instantaneously and freely and at your choice. Uh, Second, it needs a management of the network effects. And I just gave the example of Amazon as being one of those examples. Third, it needs to succeed in building a large set of users. Uh, okay, so Spotify, for example, paid influencers to talk about Spotify so that there would be more users of Spotify. This is one way to do it, uh, but there are other ways to do it. Uh, um, okay. And fourth, it needs the ability to find a business model that will allow it to monetize its huge investment in building uh, the number of users and in developing the technically superior service. Now, what I want to say that it is not obvious that innovators have all those qualities, that they can do all of this. Um, now, this has an implication when we look at merger of uh, between large platforms and startups. Uh, okay, you can have a very successful startup have developed a technically superior and very innovative service without having either the money to invest to build a large set of users, because that takes quite a bit of money, or without uh, being able to manage the network effects uh, the way Amazon did, uh, or without having a business model that works. And to come back to the same thing, Spotify is not obvious that it has found a business model that works. Uh, I mean, it tried to do a basic service and then a premium, but so far it's not making money. Uh, okay, so it, it, it's arguable whether they are going to be able to survive uh, independently. Now, all this has, of course, implications when you look at a merger between a large platform and a startup on how do I know what would have been the, the, the world if the merger had not taken place? And there's a bit too much of focus of competition authorities on the export success of the technical service which is offered by the platform and competition authorities tend to gloss over the other dimensions that one needs to be able to get there when one is alone, when one is not supported by an already existing very large uh, ecosystems. So um, the focus on the functionality of the startup rather than on the conditions under which this functionality could have developed into a successful ecosystem is a big mistake in competition authorities. I mean, that's uh, um, it's a big mistake all around. For example, if you take the UK CMA, uh, uh, no, the OFT at the time, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram uh, merger, uh, they said, oh, they are not on the same market. So first, first error because from Instagram, which was a photo app, you can develop uh, into a social media. Okay, uh, secondly, what would have Instagram come to if it had left alone? Well, it would have been very successful if it had been able to master all the elements that, uh, but the fact that it was a successful photo app doesn't mean that it had all those uh, dimensions that would have made it uh, on its own a successful uh, platform. Um, so, uh, but the competition authority didn't, didn't even go there and say, well, they are not on the same market. There's no chance that they will ever be in competition in competition with each other, which was a gross mistake, to be honest. Okay. Um, the next dimension is the fact that lots of, or most of the sec most of the services offered to users are offered for free, uh, okay? Which means that competition is largely a competition on quality and innovation. 
It's only if I have a better way to distribute music that I'm going to uh, uh, displace uh, uh, Nas Napster or iTunes, for example. Uh, or it is, uh, uh, I mean, this means that the Stiglerian static price competition model is not very useful. Uh, we are competition on innovation, competition on quality. Competition authorities have never been known to be so interested in quality. Uh, they are interested in prices, but here, to a large extent, the prices are not relevant uh, to uh, explain competition. Now, the next point, which is uh, that you're more familiar with, is data. Uh, okay, so the ability to gather data, as I explained, and, and to treat data has increased considerably. Uh, so, therefore, data and the use of artificial intelligence are crucial. Um, but the point there, in, in, really important point, is that size can mean better quality if you think about the treatment of data. The larger the size of the data of the sample of data you have, the better is going to be your algorithm of artificial intelligence able to to predict. Okay, so what we have is a relation and kind of automatic relationship between size and quality that doesn't exist in the, in the real world. And of course, size may mean decreasing competition as well. But the question is whether we have a trade-off between, okay, if I cut Google in two, uh, for example, or Facebook in two, well, half of your friends will be gone somewhere else and the interest of Facebook will be diminished. So the quality of Facebook will be diminished because there are fewer people. Uh, a, they will give you fewer services, but B, some of the network effects will have disappeared. So we are faced in this area with a, a, a trade-off between size, and this is because of the technology of artificial intelligence. If artificial intelligence was not just the ability to treat very large sets of data and to treat them all the better that they are large, uh, then we wouldn't have this problem. But there may be a contradiction between wanting to have competing ecosystems and the quality of the service that those ecosystems can, uh, uh, can give. Another dimension of data is that there may be barriers to entry uh, because uh, there is this notion that uh, um, if Amazon has access to a very large set of data, it can give extremely good and precise recommendation targeted for each consumer. It's going to be very difficult for someone else to have that kind of data and be able to treat it and, and use it. Um, so they can be uh, barriers to entry, but yet what we know is if you think of TikTok, if you think of Spotify, if you think of Instagram, all those are firms that develop without having access to a large set of data. Now they have access to a large set of data, but as they develop, they develop without this large uh, access. Uh, so even though in some cases, it may be clearly a barrier to entry, and there are specialized cases, uh, for example, the case of the uh, smart car, uh, but it's not always a barrier to entry, or there are ways in which one can overcome the, the, the lack of data. Um, so more is needed to know how to deal with data, even if we look at them from the point of view of barriers to entry. Uh, uh, we cannot just say, oh, okay, data is a barrier to entry, so somebody who has a large access to data has an advantage over everybody else, and therefore competition is not going to be able to work. Uh, it's not that simple. Um, more is needed to know how to deal with the fact that uh, data is not always a barrier to entry, and B, that accumulation of data may lead to increase in quality and that therefore you don't want to, you have an efficiency benefit there of a lack of competition brought about by the concentration of access to data. Now, I'll finish by saying that the, you, you may all be aware of the fact that uh, the EU has proposed uh, regulation, ex ante regulation, because uh, to try to overcome the uh, limitations of uh, EU law when it was, uh, and there have been a fair amount of criticism of the Digital Market Act. And I will just, I, I'm not going to go into the details of uh, the proposal, but uh, this basically this ex ante regulation, the Digital Market Act would impose different constraints on the behavior of large gatekeeper platforms. Um, now, gate, there's a question about the definition of what's a gatekeeper platform, but it's, it's a platform that you have to go through if you want to get access to a certain type of consumers uh, or users. Um, 
But the criticism are interesting because they rejoin exactly what I was saying. Uh, uh, the first type of criticism is that the DMA as it is doesn't propose a coherent set of obligations resulting from a general framework of analysis. In fact, with the DMA, the way the DMA was constructed, the, competition, the EU Commission went back to all the cases that they had had in the past, they put them in one package, and they said, okay, the solution of each case should be an obligation for uh, the gatekeepers. But so you've got several biases. First of all, one of the biases that they didn't get cases on all of the competition issues, but only on some of them. B, most of those uh, competition issues had to do with competition within an ecosystem, the relationship between a platform and the, uh, the complementers, as I uh, described in the Google case. Um, and third, they didn't try to derive lessons from those. They just put them together. Okay, so, so there is, it's very hard to find a logic to, uh, to the, Second criticism which has been voiced is the fact that the DMA imposes economically unjustified rigidities um, because it doesn't tailor the obligations to the business model of the, of the platforms. It just imposes, if you're a gatekeeper, whatever your business model, you have to respect this obligation. And for the reasons which I've mentioned, uh, because firms have very different business models, the competition issue may be very different uh, from them. Third, uh, the fact that the DMA deal with competition within ecosystems, that is the relationship between uh, the app developer or the suppliers or the uh, manufacturers of mobile phones and the platform. Okay. And basically it tries to make sure that all those complementers are not excluded unfairly in some way by the gatekeeper or the dominant uh, now, the relationship between the vertical relationship between the platform and the uh, supplier of services is fine, but nowhere does consumer welfare appear there. In other words, there are things that uh, uh, complementers may want, which will not increase the welfare of consumers, but rather decrease it, uh, uh, make it more, I mean, they will have a platform which is more clogged with, uh, with stuff that they don't necessarily uh, want uh, because there is going to be an easier access uh, to the platform. So really the DMA defends the small guys, the developers, the, uh, the uh, OEMs, I mean, the, the manufacturers of uh, mobile equipment, et cetera, but doesn't defend the consumers, uh, the users of, of the uh, ecosystems. Um, and finally, uh, the criticism was the fact that uh, the DMA doesn't differentiate between uh, the efficiency effects uh, of some of those practices and their competition effects and doesn't give a clue as to how to uh, take into consideration the fact that there are dynamic efficiencies that may come from things which are restricting uh, competition. Uh, it only looks at the competition aspect and doesn't want uh, uh, to get into the issue of qualities. Um, now, each one of those criticisms, and, and I have summarized the literature on which has been critical of, uh, I mean, there are other uh, critics, but, but uh, those are the main points, but they all relate to the issue that the business model of ecosystem is different from the business model of pipeline firms. And that uh, this, if this is not taken into consideration, then you are likely to make uh, uh, mistakes. So, what is the solution? This is my conclusion. My conclusion is that competition authorities could do a good job with this, but for this, they have to go through a number of adaptation. Among them, uh, they have to consider competition between ecosystem and its relationship to competition within ecosystem. That's the first thing. The second thing, they have to analyze competition across market and stop looking at uh, uh, or using tools which are very good for competition in the market between firms which are in the same market uh, because that's not the issue. Third, <clears throat> they have to rethink competition law. We have a uh, static price Stiglerian model of competition uh, which is fine for a great many problems. Here we have a quality and innovation, Schupenterian kind of competition, 
across market. So we've, we've got to develop the tools that would allow us to, to judge this uh, uh, better. We have to find the adequate instrument to replace uh, the market power indicators don't work very well at all because there is no relationship uh, between price and cost in, in uh, the kind of business model that I was uh, uh, explaining. So, and most of our indicators of market powers are based on the difference between the mar profit margin or something like this, a difference between price and cost. So we've got to rethink how we can assess uh, market power uh, uh, among uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, take on board the fact that different uh, business models may require different solutions and reinvent the notion of potential competition uh, for the reasons which I've explained, uh, where potential competition, first of all, from the legal point of view, can be someone who is in a completely different field than you are, uh, but could use this algorithm to offer services that would compete with your services, okay? So it's really much more potential than in, in the doctrine, and B, it can come from people who do completely different things from what you do. Uh, okay, so the question is whether they could adapt their technology to uh, offer a set of services that would compete with the, the particular set of services that you're uh, offering. Finally, to think about data uh, more uh, precisely, uh, to, so to reconsider the trade-off between size and efficiency, and also to try to be more precise about when data can be considered to be a barrier to entry or when can data be, uh, uh, or the lack of data can be overcome for entry. Now, if we do this, there is no reason why we should not, using our traditional approach to competition law, have a uh, satisfactory solution of the, uh, the problems and avoid making gross mistakes, which I think we have done, uh, a little bit like we've done gross mistakes in, in, uh, in some of the uh, developments of uh, payment card systems, because we did not understand properly the logic between, in that case, two sided markets. So, um, if competition authorities are bent on applying what they've always applied to the digital sector, I think they're going straight into a wall and uh, that this is going to have dire consequences for the future of competition authorities. That's my message. That's what I wanted to say. Wow. Very many thanks. It was uh, great, uh, a very thorough uh, presentation. And we, we have already two, two people uh, that have uh, uh, raised their interest in, in asking questions. One is Carlos Mena from Mexico, and then Esteban Greco from Argentina. Carlos. Thank you, Julian. Nice to see you, Fred. A great, great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I want to see in Europe and what you think about that, and especially what you think of, of other jurisdictions having the same type of regulation and then the problem of uh, how to harmonize the efforts around the world with this kind of of regulation with this kind of companies that have a global business model. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, to uh, be very brief on this, uh, I think we have indeed two problems. One of them is a problem of coordination between competition authorities. What we're seeing now is that each national competition authority decide that it has a Google case or an Apple case or whatever case, uh, and they all make decisions. In fact, on the same issues, because by nature, those ecosystems are nowhere, they're everywhere, okay? but they are not in a territory, just like they are not. Uh, okay. So th there's a first question, which is, is that a sensible way to do things? Because the same issues are raised in many different jurisdictions. And wouldn't there be a better way to organize things? Uh, so either to have a global competition authority for the global uh, globalization of uh, 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 the digital sector, or to have a system of rec mutual recognition of decision or something, but that would not duplicate infinitely the same uh, debate, sometimes with the same solution, but sometimes with different solutions. Uh, so I think that 
the, the question that you raise is uh, uh, now if we don't move, if we, I mean, we do have competition rules which are based on, uh, on uh, um, the effects doctrine. So, okay, so uh, as long as we have uh, many different jurisdictions, we are going to have uh, many different competition authorities taking the same decision or taking similar de decision on similar things. What I am personally, and I come back to uh, the, uh, the history of competition authorities and payment system. Okay. They have taken, it has taken 20 years for the Supreme Court of the US, the Supreme Court of uh, the EU to finally understand what was a two-sided market and how you could look at it or adapt competition to two-sided markets. In the meanwhile, you have had contradictory decisions, for example, on uh, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, on um, whether you could impose a surcharge for uh, paying uh, with a card, uh, all, all kinds of uh, uh, issues. You have had countries where uh, the uh, there has been a regulation, a price regulation imposed on uh, the interchange fees. Uh, other countries that have decided that you couldn't do that from the competition point of view, a big mess. Now the mess was understandable because we did not really understand the economic and technological logic which was behind this. Now, if we could avoid a repeat of this, now we are doing it in the sense that particularly at the OECD, but not only at the OECD, also in other forums, there's a lot of attempt to try to clarify what the issues are and to try to, as I've done today, but for example, at OECD, we've organized, I think, nearly 20 roundtables uh, already on, on digital issue and competition to try to bring competition authorities to a common understanding of what the issues are. But this is really urgent, uh, and particularly in the case of the digital, because uh, competition authorities are under pressure to act uh, and to act fast. Uh, and every day that they don't do anything is seen as a day when they should have done something. And, uh, and therefore you have all those proposals to change competition law and make it uh, quite different from uh, uh, what we know. Uh, so I'm trying to say that a cooperation for establishing the basic understanding of the competition issues in the digital sector is very useful. This is done in forums, uh, uh, in uh, various forums. When it comes to decisions, whether it makes sense to have a great many jurisdictions, each of them analyzing for itself uh, this, rather than having a superior level of cooperation, which in my mind would be something like uh, uh, mutual recognition of decisions, is arguable. Uh, maybe we have a very inefficient process, which is fine as long as markets are national, but not so fine when markets are global. Very clear. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred, for your clever insights on, on the issue. We always learn from these kind of thoughts. And I, I, I want to ask you about uh, your view. You know very well um, Latin American competition agencies, almost 20 years of Latin American forums. Uh, and uh, from the Latin American point of view, maybe the big tech issues are not in the same place in pol public policy agenda in Latin America. Also, we have a lower, um, level of digitalization and, and, and internet usage and, uh, and coverage. Uh, and there are a lot of issues where uh, digital players uh, are uh, disruptive. And, and are, uh, you, we can see many cases uh, where digital players are uh, entrants and, and uh, traditional incumbents are trying to protect their uh, markets or, or their services. So uh, I, I think maybe the, Latin, the, the role for competition policy and, and competition law enforcement in Latin America can have a little different uh, way to, to go ahead than uh, in, in the international debate about this big tech and this global 
competition process uh, or, um, between these uh, companies. How do you uh, see this uh, process in Latin America? I, I think there are two different issues. One of them is, and you may be right, saying that, well, we have other competition problems which may be more urgent right now. So therefore, in terms of prioritization, we don't need to prioritize uh, digital cases. Fine. I mean, I tend to think that uh, this very much depends on the local conditions uh, uh, and therefore completely uh, acceptable. But the other side is the fact that we are all looking for a methodology to face those issues. Those issues are going to come to Latin America at some point. Uh, that, that's very clear. We all start from the same place, which is we don't understand anything about ecosystems. And we, I mean, at least I start from this, but, but I think that it's, uh, it's fairly uh, obvious. And it seems to me that in this discussion on how could we conceivably implement the principles of competition law to, uh, to ecosystems and to digital uh, tech, every competition authority, and particularly the competition authority in Latin America, who have very good people, should contribute to uh, the discussion. That's not the same thing as saying that they should uh, bring cases or, or consider that uh, those cases should be a priority. But we, the fastest we get our act together uh, on how to deal with those issues, which are complex issues and, and, and require, I think, a, a real retooling of uh, competition, uh, the better it is. And I don't see that competition authorities in Latin America who's who have had already cases. I mean, as you said, I mean, the, the cases are a bit different. The cases are the cases of, uh, okay, I'm, I don't know, I'm a taxi and I'm, don't ha I'm not happy to see Uber uh, competing with me. And uh, so I want to, uh, uh, to deal with it. But the next case is that uh, Uber decides to be not only a taxi service, uh, but also to deliver food uh, at home. And uh, so there are grocers and uh, other people who get that. so. I think that I would not, uh, I think there's entirely too much, in fact, uh, enforcement in, in other countries because we do enforcement without understanding what the, or without a clear view of what the, uh, the issues are. But I think that what we should hasten and where everybody has, I mean, you have excellent economists in competition authorities in, in Latin America, and they should contribute to the, uh, to the thinking on, on how we could deal with those issues. So I think that now is the time for this second, more reflective uh, part. Uh, and I think that Latin American competition authorities should take uh, a big part in it because it is going to be a, a major problem. It's, it's obvious that the economy is moving in the sense of the digitalization. Uh, the equipment uh, is uh, increasing. Uh, so, you know, in five years or 10 years from now, I mean, you all have exactly the same uh, issues that uh, everybody talks about uh, today. Um, so it's worth investing today in uh, trying to think on how one will react to that. Now to Chile, to Felipe. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Fred, for, for your insight. And, and also thanks, uh, Julian, for Foro Competencia and, and the OECD. Uh, and I, I think the OECD is giving us a, a lot of light um, in the region on, on what's, what are the main challenges. Here's my question. Suppose, Fred, that all the countries knock on your door on a Saturday morning and ask you to draft an international law for antitrust issues and also to build an international agency in relation to the challenges of, of the digital economy. What would you do first? Would it work? What would be the main challenges? Is this a feasible scenario? And if so, when do you think it could happen? Um, first of all, I never said that one need a new institution. Uh, uh, and I think that in your question, there are several aspects. Uh, I will leave aside the institutional one, which is the most tricky to solve. 
uh, I don't really see, uh, but uh, I don't know, maybe at the sector level, this could be conceivable that there is a great appetite to create uh, new uh, multilateral institutions. Uh, uh, so, uh, but you ask what would be the challenge? I think that I have explained what the challenge is. The challenge is to think about what kind, how could we uh, establish a competition law for the digital sector, a competition law which would make sense for the digital sector. Now, I, I finished with what I thought was a, a fairly uh, precise plan of what are the analytical issues that we were to sort out. Yeah. Who can help us sort them out is the economists. Uh, the first stage were the business policy people because they were able to explain how this works uh, in general terms. The second step is to have uh, people who are able to say, okay, knowing what I know about the, I mean, the generalities of how they work uh, and knowing the principles of competition law, how do I establish what could be conceivably a violation from what could be conceivably a pro-efficiency? Uh, how do I measure the two? How do I balance them when they are both present? Uh, uh, if when are data really a barrier to entry and which kind of data? Uh, really any data, transform data, analyze data? I mean, okay, there are all kinds of uh, issues there. We have this issue in the connected car, uh, for example. Uh, okay. So I think the challenge is to force economists to draw on the literature of uh, business policy on uh, the digital to help us devise the tests that we could apply to apply the general legal principles of uh, So it's there that there is, uh, uh, so I would first have a study group uh, of economists, economists and competition authorities to try to say, okay, how do we assess market power? Okay, clearly price margin is not going to do the trick. Uh, okay. So what kind of information can I reasonably hope to have that would tell me something about uh, the market power of, uh, uh, an animal which is simultaneously on many markets uh, uh, and also shifts from one market to another, to another uh, all the time. Um, I can get a handle on this. So I don't think that it's unfeasible. I think it requires a lot of thinking and that economies are really uh, important in this process, uh, competition economies. Then after that, there are plenty of lawyers like you who can easily translate this into legal uh, standards. Um, Thank you. Um, is it feasible? I think it is because, I mean, that's what we're trying to do. I always know what I'm trying to push uh, as much as I can. And <clears throat> I must say that we are much more advanced uh, now on this than uh, we were uh, after two or three years of uh, uh, payment systems, uh, where there was not, where there was not the same push to try to get together to confront the uh, the possible problems. Anyone has a question? I have a, a question, uh, if I may. Uh, um, lately, this particular issue has been also part of the political agenda in, in different countries, especially in the United States. And uh, how do you see um, this uh, political pressure uh, affecting the um, antitrust analysis of, 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 of the current and future cases in, 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 in the coming months? Where's your question precisely? Do I see the developments in the US? No, no, the, the United States and, and, and other countries, the, the, the political pressure from, from, from outside the, 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 the competition world on competition in, in yeah. oh, yeah. the digital economy in particular. Only if, I, if I talk about Europe and, and the US, there's a huge political pressure, uh, which leads competition authorities to say, oh, oh give me uh, quasi, quasi regulatory uh, instruments so that I can go faster. I don't have to do all the analysis and I just can act, uh, which I think is a terrible development because 
once they have those instruments, if they don't understand precisely how competition works, they may misuse them. Uh, but why do they do this? They do this because they're under pressure, because there are articles. How come the competition authority haven't done anything about the, I mean, the, the, the origin of the pressure is really a populist uh, 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 movement uh, that, uh, but irrespective of this, the question for competition authority is, I have to act. Uh, now, this was part of the debate between Europe and the US for a while, because uh, the US authorities, this was under the previous administration, uh, would say, look, you know, uh, we should not intervene unless we completely understand what the issues are. Um, and the European would say, there's no time. Uh, by the time we understand, it will be too late. So give me measures, interim measures, uh, I mean, powers to uh, declare interim measures, even without the full analysis. Um, I can always correct them later on, but I have to uh, intervene immediately. Okay. Now, that pressure has increased and is now also in the US. Uh, uh, um, so yes, uh, I think that competition authorities are under a lot of pressure uh, to act. And I'm worried about the fact that they act when they don't fully understand the consequences of what they do. And I'm equally worried by the fact that if they don't act, then you have, uh, this is more the US uh, thing, then you have people come along and say, oh, we should have a completely different set of uh, principles for competition law that, uh, than we have. And they deconstruct competition law as we know it. Wow. Camila? Yes, hello, thank you very much for the discussion. It was really interesting. Um, I would like to know your opinion on the existence of regulations such as the GDPR and notions such as um, data portability in the tackling of these issues of um, data as a barrier when it is a barrier, of course. Um, I'm, I'm not going to answer really on the GDPR because I think I don't have all the elements to know. I mean, there, there are very uh, contrasted views on, of uh, whether the GDPR imposes a cost on society, which is very high. And it's not clear to me one way or the other uh, because I haven't studied it uh, so sufficiently precisely. But on the issue of uh, data as barriers to entry, uh, I have a little approach of this because I've uh, worked on the issue of the connected car, and I've realized that uh, um, the issue is not only the nature of the data, but the, the, the system in which it's harvested. Uh, in the connected car, you have, for example, a clear divide between the car manufacturers who say, uh, well, this is my car, so it's going to be connected to my computer, and I'm going to get the data, and if you force me, I'll give them to uh, uh, competitors or insurance company or repair uh, people uh, or even Google uh, to uh, provide the services. Uh, a lot, in a lot of cases, uh, it's not going to work from the competition point of view because the data is not going to be accessed in real time by the competitors. Uh, uh, somebody forget their microphone, but that's fine. Uh, okay, so you realize that you have to think of the architecture of how the data is harvested simultaneously with the competition issue. If you want real competition, you need to have a different system from the system where the information from the car is directly transmitted to the manufacturer of the car. You need maybe this information to be transmitted to a neutral party uh, who will then dispatch at the same time, the same data to everybody. But all this requires infrastructures which are going to determine uh, the effectiveness or the lack of effectiveness of uh, competition. Now, this is very detailed, so I'm not going to pursue that. But what I'm saying is that when we think, when we talk about data, this is a very general terms, and we have to be much more precise. The conditions in which the data is, uh, is harvested, uh, the possible use of the data uh, by uh, different types of competitors, of course, the security issues, and, and there are plenty of uh, other issues, to try to get a handle on 
when is it a legitimate bad country because it improves uh, quality and when is it an illegitimate an attempt to monopolize data in order to prevent others from getting access to it. Uh, um, so it's, it's I, I know it's not, uh, you're not satisfied probably with my answer because I don't, uh, uh, I mean, I see what the problems are. I'm not sure what the solutions are, but I think that we should stop saying data are a barrier to entry, which is the mantra of a lot of competition authority and be more precise about what we mean and under which condition they are. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that was very clear. Interesting. Well, from Mexico to Argentina, Eduardo. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fred and Julian, for this uh, uh, so interesting uh, discussion. Um, because of, of the reason that you already uh, gave, uh, uh, Fred, um, uh, I'm not very enthusiastic about uh, the uh, DMA uh, project. No, uh, basically, I, I think that we're learning, and this kind of project assumes that we already know. No, and also I find very very complex to execute it, and also very dangerous. No, for no? but I would like to know how is distributed the expert and political opinion concerning this project in in, in Europe already. Are most of experts are enthusiastic about it? Uh, what about uh, politicians? Because sometimes it's very difficult uh, uh, to separate no? uh, political opinion uh, and uh, antitrust stages uh, development. No? It is, if you look in the history, yeah. I think that you're going to find that the context, the context, the idea, the uh, the basic ideas, sure, no, but economics and legal uh, scholars, but also politicians, uh, is very important to define uh, a change in the antitrust politics. So, what is basically distribution of the opinion between experts and politicians concerning uh, the DMA uh, project? Uh, interesting question and, and complex question. Uh, the complex part is politicians. First of all, I don't see in Europe a politician being able to say, no, we don't need a regulation of uh, uh, big tech. Okay. Uh, that would be a politician who is uh, about to retire that would say that, but that's about it. So, so A, you have this bias that uh, oh, there's clearly a problem. Something has to be done. And Usually the politicians, and I mean the members of parliament, have certainly not gone into any of the details that we were talking about to, to know what makes sense. So they rely on competition authorities. So the opinion of competition authorities on the DMA is, well, first, uh, the explicit assumption, and, and I say explicit because uh, Olivier Gerson, who is the, the head of the DG Comp, uh, mentioned it uh, explicitly. Uh, uh, the assumption is that all the past decisions of the commission were good decisions. So it was a great job to put them into a, a uh, together and to impose them in general. Okay. So there's something flawed at, at the origin uh, because you can ask yourself, well, maybe they were good, but maybe they were bad. I mean, should we examine that? Okay. Um, so the EU commission is very favorable to its project. The national authorities see a way to intervene. So basically their line is to say, it's great if we can apply it. So we don't want it to be a monopoly of the commission. We want to have a piece of the action, uh, okay. which doesn't say much really about the uh, whether it's a good uh, reform, but they are under pressure to act. They don't want the European, I mean, there's competition among competition authorities, and then that's what's happening in, in Europe, okay? Uh, so they don't want the European Commission to be the only one who can intervene against the, uh, the big guys, and they want to be able to participate, and for, therefore they want to enforce. This is the Franco-German initiative uh, to say, we have to implement the, uh, this as well. Okay? Uh, economies tend to be reserved or hostile. At the very least, they are reserved for some of the reasons which I've mentioned. Uh, but the core hostility is here you have a regulation 
first of all, nobody knows who would be in charge of, uh, of uh, enforcing the regulation within the commission. It is not taken for granted they would be DG Comp. Uh, uh, so that's uh, uh, first problem. But, but more fundamentally, from the economic point of view, this is a regulation that's supposed to be about competition, which doesn't talk about innovation and doesn't talk about consumer welfare. How can it be the right thing to do? Um, there's no, no perspective. So then I, I gave you most of the objections which have been done even by economists which have been um, uh, asked by the commission to express themselves on the DMA. I mean, uh, you know, for, okay. Uh, so very reserved on the economic underpinning, find it very unsettled, sometimes irrelevant, uh, and certainly missing the point of, uh, uh, um, what's more interesting is that uh, federations of app developers have come out against the DME by saying what you're creating is a monster for us uh, and uh, you're increasing our costs and you're decreasing our ability to, to navigate them. I mean, I'm not going to go into all the details. Now, one never knows whether they were agitated by the big guys or whether they were spontaneously saying that. So I'm putting all this in, in you know, with, with a reserve. Uh, so that's basically it. Uh, I, mean, if, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, there are a lot of criticism, but, but the thing is that a lot of those criticism is, um, I mean, the economies are pretty homogeneous by saying this is not going to do it. This is not the way you build a regulation. And basically what they're saying is that unless you really understand what the competition issues are, you can neither come up with good decision nor come up with good regulation. So let's go back to the drawing board and let's try to figure out what the uh, trade-offs are. Um, okay, but politicians are not willing to listen to that. Thank you very much, friend. Well, we have time for one last question, Alfonso from Colombia. Thank you, Julian, and thank you, Fred, for a very interesting conference. Um, um, my question is, is this, um, when, when we um, analyze the digital markets, um, uh, many kinds of problems arise, like consumer protection, competition, data protection. In Colombia, we have the, the competition authority is also the Consumer Protection Authority and the Data Protection Authority. Do you think that this is, um, from, from your perspective, that you have seen so, so many uh, legal systems in action, do you think that this is preferable? Should, should a country like Colombia maintain the capacity for data protection, consumer protection, and the competition uh, application uh, in the same authority? Or do you think that it's... Um, better to divide this kind of, of functions for, for a better application um, of these laws regarding the digital markets? Uh, I have a personal feeling, but it's only a personal feeling because we, we had at OECD, uh, we organized a, a round table among competition authorities on institutional design, which is exactly what you're talking about, yes. except that you're applying it to the digital sector in particular. Uh, and um, the, the result of this was completely divided. Not only was it divided, but uh, because you have all possible cases, you have the case where the competition authority is a regulator, the case where the regulator enforces competition in, in, the, in the regulated sector, that the cases where they have to work together. The, uh, yeah, so, okay. And you have changes in countries. And I remember because I, I, I counted, uh, not only do you have an equal number of changes in both directions uh, between sectoral regulators and competition authority. In other words, you have countries where you had competition authority also was the re sectoral regulator, and then they became separated. And you have other countries where they were separated and they become one. And the number of countries moving in one direction is exactly the same as the number of countries moving in the other direction. But what is more interesting is that the reasons they give for those contradictory movements are exactly the same. 
uh, they always say it's to have a better implementation of the competition law and the sector regulation. Okay. So I want to put them together because this is going to improve the quality. Uh, I want to separate them because this is going to improve the quality because they get big. <laughs> it's always the same argument. So there's not much I can say uh, about this, except that in the digital sector, as you rightly point out, there is a con uh, there are considerations not only of competition, but of consumer protection, uh, privacy, uh, and they all have implications for the other. This is a bit the question that we had about yes. the uh, GPD earlier on. So I think personally that uh, beyond the practical considerations, which are um, uh, Practical consideration is that many countries cannot afford to have so many re different regulators. Yes. Okay, so that's a powerful. That's probably the best argument for having everybody uh, in the same uh, institution. But in this case, given the fact that we have those different angles and that they have repercussions on the on the other, I think that it's a very good thing that uh, there you the uh, in your case uh, you have an authority which covers the whole range because at least they can have a consistent view of what the implications are of data protection for uh, or privacy for competition and vice versa. Um, so I think it's a definite, definitely a plus. Thank you, thank you for your answer. Thank you. Well, Fred, uh, uh, time for your final remarks. Final remarks. I've given my final <laughs> remarks <laughs> earlier on, so I don't have to except to thank you for having me and, and for the interaction, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, but no, I think that my position is reasonably clear, is that uh, we need to get some work done uh, as competition authorities, and the sooner the better, and the more we gather our forces to, I mean, we put our forces together, the, the, the easier will be the solution and the faster will be the solution. Great. Thank you very much, Fred. It was a, uh, a great pleasure. And for all of you, I wait, uh, the, the next breakfast will take place on October 21st. And the guest speaker will be the president of CADE, Alexander Cordero. Uh, so it was, I'll see you then. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you. Thank you. you. Very nice, soon. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Nice to see everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Julian and Fred. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.